like to welcome everyone for another uh, Chat with Traders Community presentation. And uh, I'd like, love to welcome back Eric Smolensky. I interviewed him back in episode 272. So if you'd like some more background on Eric, listen to that uh, episode. Eric, welcome back. Stoked to be here. Thanks for having me. So based on our last conversation, actually, after we did the podcast together, we talked a little bit about options, and I obviously spent a lot of my life working with options. And I'm going to go through a few things. I want to start with some common misconceptions. Then I want to talk about some use cases. Then I want to talk about a quick overview of derivatives, what they are to help familiarize us. And then at the end, I want to go through some common misconceptions. Now, a couple just general notes. I do have a YouTube channel and I spend a lot of time making videos by myself. What that means is not only are you completely unable to interrupt me, meaning I want you to, I want you guys to ask questions. There's no reason to wait. If there's something that you want to explore, if there's something that's not clear, just literally tell me, you can either come off mute and let me know, you can throw it in the chat, but the whole idea behind this session is for it to be interactive because if you're anything like me i learn way better that way so that's the goal now i'm going to share my screen and i have a little bit of a road map to help keep us on track moving along okay so let's just get this out of the way this is a quick just rundown on who i am and what i'm about I want to be very transparent about my motivations for doing this, those kinds of things. And I have no books to sell. I have no courses to sell. I do this stuff because I, I genuinely enjoy talking about this stuff. I grew up poor as shit. And because of some information that was shared with me, it literally set me down a different path. So this is literally me paying that effort forward. That's really all this is about. And we need to spend no more time here. What I want to start with, though, are some common retail trading mistakes, specifically as it pertains to options. Now, the whole context of the session today is not options as how can you trade options as options. It's really about how can most people in this community, which very stock trader heavy people investing in equities, how can people that primarily use equities for their vehicles integrate options? And there are different ways you can do that. Options are what's known as a strategic investment. It's a kind of product that has a variable profile that can fit different use cases, which we're going to go through that. But when we talk about options, it's important to level set. Because if you look at this kind of amateur side over here, you're going to find some common threads between what people who mess with options and are unsuccessful tend towards, and then what people who are successful with options tend towards. Now, a couple just admin notes. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is baked on two different things. Some of it is from my own experience doing this. I started in 2007. So I've been doing this for a minute now. Some of this, a lot of it is based on research. I spend a lot of time reading different research papers from places like SSRN. I bring that up because if you ever have a question between is this your opinion, Eric, or is this based on some research that you can refer me to, ask me. Because most of it, I can refer you to research. That's what the vast majority of this is predicated on. Every single thing I say should be taken with a grain of salt. I am an online dude sitting in my house right now talking to you guys. So everything needs to be filtered for the BS detector, but then you should also be able to find the information for yourselves. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of fly through these real quick because what I want to highlight here is a problem with approach, understanding, and mindset. So if you look at the difference between kind of a professional, and when I say professional in this context, I'm not talking about somebody that works in an institution. I'm talking about a professional retail trader, somebody who does this for their primary income. That's what I do. So when we think about approaches, there's a giant difference between professionals and amateurs, and it really boils down to one thing. Amateurs treat trading, not just options trading, trading in general is a hobby. It's something that's just kind of done on the side and you get that kind of output, something that's done on the side. Professionals do not 
take that approach. We apply pretty significant rigor to what we do as if our live and livelihood depends on it, because quite literally it does. It's a completely different perspective. So what this means is when you're looking at a lot of people talk about options, you're going to see, especially if you're on places like Reddit, which I actually highly encourage you to check out because you'll learn a lot there. But in places like that, you'll find people talk about things like YOLOing options and they're only buying options. They really have no true understanding of the products and they don't understand the nuance, which can come back to bite them. So what are the expectations between these two different groups? Pros are looking long run. We're not looking at things as I need to make $100 a day on my $5,000 account. Because if you do the math on that, it's nonsensical. We confuse ourselves into thinking $100, that's not a lot of money. That seems reasonable on a $5,000 account. That's, that's pretty good. But if you look at the compound of return of doing that, it's massive. It's in the thousands of percent return on an annual basis. It's wild. So having effective expectations up front is the bed for all of this. Because if you start the world of trading thinking that, ah, this is easy, there's a low barrier to entry, I'm good just kind of figuring it out, think of how egotistical that is. There are people that literally dedicate their entire lives to try to figure this out, but yet the thought is we could just open a brokerage account and we're gonna start performing the same as them. There's a thing called a skill gap. It's a mental lapse that people have. It's again, something you can look up, but long story short, skill gap is where you see somebody doing something that looks easy. What we're not perceiving is what goes into making it look easy. So for example, I like to surf and play jujitsu. If you do either of those and you see somebody that's good, it looks effortless. They're not breathing heavy. They can move real easy if you're surfing. They don't paddle that much. They can catch the waves. And then as soon as you get out there and realize even to sit on a surfboard without tipping off is actually pretty difficult up front. And you're like, okay, there's a big difference here. This comes down to having healthy expectations because if I'm a beginner surfer, is my bar performing the same as Kelly Slater who won a bunch of competitions? Or is my bar relative to me who's never surfed before and I gotta learn how to sit on the damn board. Meanwhile, I'm not surfing pipeline, which has like four inches of water over a jagged coral reef. Big difference. It comes down to expectations. Now, one other thing I wanna labor, belabor a little bit more is this right here. There's a reason why it's in here twice. It's not a typo. The amateur mindset, which is one that I resonated with for some time, is this idea of quick. We're looking for quick, quick, quick. Where can I find quick money? That is probably the worst mental model to apply the markets with. And it's because sometimes you'll get what you ask for. What that means is you're looking for quick money. You might actually find it and options can provide that to you. I'm actually going to go through an example in a little bit of a few recent trades that I've made both good and bad. And you'll find that you can make some money pretty damn quick. Problem though, is you get what you ask for made money quick. You got to figure it out, right? It's all good. Now you could repeat that into perpetuity. If you think about the lifespan of a trader, hopefully you start in your twenties and hopefully you live to your 70 plus 50 year time frame. You got it all figured out. What I'm highlighting here is that if you start to find success really early, those people tend to oversize because they're now overestimating their skill set, and then they experience massive drawdown that drawdown can be catastrophic. Again, depending on what your trading objectives are, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next up here, tracking. How many people here, just out of curiosity, you can throw it in the chat or you can come off and let me know, but how many people here have like a written trading plan? Just out of curiosity. Tessa has one, which is great. So Marilyn also has one that's great. Good. Okay. So we have a couple people that have trading plans. There's several people in the session now. And for the people that are listening to the recording, answer that question. Honestly, think of it this way. The markets, they have near infinite variables. If you think about it, the downstream impacts of just stock price moving, there's so many inputs quite, quite literally, you couldn't track them all. If you try, you can get the big ones, but you can't find them all. 
And your job as a trader is to interface with a multivariate, meaning has many variables, interface, the markets. So you're supposed to find a way to interact with that successfully. And well, don't forget the market, they have changes all the time. We have periods where the market's going up, down, sideways, volatility is changing. And our mindset is, well, we can just remember everything that works in each of those circumstances. It seems pretty difficult to me. I don't have a great memory, so maybe I'm an exceptional you know, example of the other side of that example. But really what I'm highlighting there is when I think about the difference between people who do a good job at this and the people who don't, the people who do a good job at this, they are looking for ways to make things better. They're not looking for validation on their ideas. What that means is if I have a hypothesis of a strategy that may or may not work, I'm not going out there to try to prove how it can work. I'm going out there to see how it performs objectively. And then if I have good tracking mechanisms on the background, I can then see, did it work? What conditions did it work in? How well did it work? One other note on this, because the whole trading plan thing is really something that's part and parcel to who I am. And it's because for the first couple of years of my trading, I didn't have one. I was too lazy. I was one of the very normal people who mistake the very low barrier to entry to markets as ease. What that means is if you think about getting into the stock market, what do you have to do? You just have to open up a brokerage account. That's it. Anybody can do it. You just have to open up a brokerage account. Yet, what if I were to tell you your job in life now is to try to play a professional sport? Is your approach in that scenario to just walk on the field and hope it works out because you can walk on the field? No, probably not. It's the same thing in trading. Don't let the low barrier to entry confuse you. It's low barrier to entry. Anybody can start. That does not mean it's easy to do. And that leads to the final point here, which is based on outcome. People who figure out how to do this, they have two primary traits. The first one is you'll see in their outcomes, capital expansion, meaning they're making money, and they have a desired volatility profile. Volatility, you'll hear me say that term a lot, especially options traders. It's kind of like one of our pet words. But from a statistical perspective, I have a stats background. Volatility is just movement, dispersion. So anytime you hear the term volatility, just think movement. So in this case, why does that matter? Because people have emotions, people have specific return objectives. So not only the ability to create a positive return, but to control some of the path is extremely important in order to achieve your desired outcomes. The time that people abandon strategies is twofold. First one, when things are going bad and they don't trust their strategy. That's the second thing. A lot of people talk about this idea of writing out a plan, which is good. You should have a written plan. Here's the problem. If you have a written plan that just exists of stuff that you shoved in a Word document and you don't really believe or trust the data, how likely are we to follow that plan? Not much at all. So the idea behind that is when we're building a trading plan, we want to track information, create feedback loops so that we can create data sets that confirm or deny what we're looking for, and that allows us to achieve this outcome. This over here is the path for most retail traders. And again, I get really frustrated when people throw out all kinds of BS heuristics like 93% lose over five years. This is from a series of studies, and I can share those studies with you guys so that you can look them up for yourselves. And with that, while I'm doing that, if there's any questions on this specific section, I'm happy to talk about them. If there's any feedback, is there anything in here that surprises anybody, anything like that? So I have a quick question. Uh, the 93% yeah. that lose over yep. five years, are you talking about uh, options traders specifically or stock and options traders? It's a perfect question. And it's actually an even better data set for most people that is for day traders. And the reason why I use the day trader statistic is you can't really find other ones. I'm hoping to find one that segments traders more effectively. But that study is from, let me tell you, it's called Trading is Hazardous to Your Wealth. 
the common stock investment performance of individual investors. It's from 2000 by Barber and Odin. Those are from uh, University of California. So you can look up that study. I'll throw it in the chat so that you guys can check it out. Again, that's available for free on SSRN. I have no affiliation with any of these guys. But yeah, that's a good question, Ian. And it's something that I think is still worth calling out to your point because I view stuff like that also as if you think of the majority of traders, if you see like, man, 93%, that means 7% stay, that's tough, right? That's not great numbers, still possible, but tough. But then I look at the majority of the people who try trading that 93% and most of them are just doing lazy or average things. So it's not to my surprise to see them not succeed. If you think this 93%, you put it on a bell curve, the majority of them are gonna fall within that mean, give or take. And when I look at that number, it actually doesn't dissuade me because I think, okay, well, 7% are able to figure it out. Of that 93% that can't figure it out, I would wager 50% of that, 60% of that are just lazy people who are going on YOLOing options and it's not working. So then there's probably a much smaller subset of that group that's really trying and still not able to figure it out. And I find for those kinds of people, trading just might not be their thing. That's a fact of the matter. When you're trading, there are certain things that you have to just get used to working around. And one of the things I think about, and I see traders do all the time, is we want really neat, clean descriptors of what happened, right? What happened in stock XYZ today? Oh, well, this happened, this happened, that led to price doing all of this stuff. The fact of the matter is like, we're just guessing. We don't know. You can come up with some ideas for sure. But the fact of the matter is, is something could have moved because this company had a position or this hedge fund had a position that they needed to unwind because they wanted to move the capital somewhere else. It could be nondescript. The point being is you have to get used to interacting with an, a system that you'll never have the full answer for. You were working perpetually with imperfect information and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. That's one of the beautiful things I find with veterans and military people with you know my background is that we're, we're used to that. You typically have a part of the picture and that's what you get to operate within. But if you can accept that kind of thing early on, that you're working with the system that you'll never fully be able to discreetly explain everything that happens, you're far better off. If FOMC releases and there's a big surprise there, the market's gonna react. You can discreetly tie those two. Plenty of instances like that. However, there are also plenty of times where a company reports really great earnings and price tanks. Why? Well, you might look and say, well, maybe the guidance was soft. Maybe it was, sometimes it's not. There are instances where a company reports beats expectations and has good guidance, but it still drops. Why? Because something might've been different outside of expectations, whatever the case is. It's an imperfect system, difficult to interface with. So these are some just common trader mistakes that I want us to keep in mind as we work through the rest of this. And I think it's important because the sooner you can shift the way you think about these things, the better you can build good habits. One of the hardest things to do is redact bad habits that have been built for long periods of time. So retail, common trading mistakes, done. Next thing I wanna show you are some use cases for options. And here there's a couple practical examples we'll go through. And then I'm actually gonna walk you through a recent trade that I did um, here. So here are a handful, I got six. There's probably more, like if I was trying to create an exhaustive list, but there's definitely more uses for options in this, but these are kind of six big ticket items. And we'll work through these one by one relatively quickly. Now. The first thing I'm curious though, does anybody understand, let's say what trading volatility or what structural alpha is? Do you have any ideas what I mean by those? Uh, I don't know the structural alpha, to be honest. Yeah, that's totally fair. A lot of people don't. It's actually, one of the main reasons we can trade something like options that gives us effective exposure to sources of structural alpha. So the idea of alpha for everybody's general awareness, it's essentially excess return over a benchmark over the market that's commonly cited. So 
It's actually why if you've ever heard of the the website Seeking Alpha, it's such a great name. That's Seeking Excess Return. It's kind of cool, clever. Anyways, um, when we think about structural alpha, though, there are pockets in the market that you can find places where things have a built-in advantage. That might sound kind of crazy, especially if you are an efficient market hypothesis aficionado, especially the strong form. So here's the next question for you all. If I'm telling you there are sources of structural alpha, what does that mean when it comes to something like the CAPM model or the efficient market hypothesis? How can those two exist at the same time? Anybody have an idea? No idea. Fair. The reason why it exists is because the strong form of the efficient market hypothesis, it has shortfalls. It's not accurate. We objectively know it's not true. And that's not to, you know, down on the research. Again, you can find a lot of instances where we can see things like structural alpha. You guys are stock traders here. Who here is familiar with the concept of PEED? Post earnings announcement drift. Anybody familiar with that? Oh, this is good because if you're not familiar with Pete, then I can give you some free game. So let me grab a quick piece of research for you guys specifically on Pete. And this is again something you guys can look up. Here you go. This is a more recent one. There's a couple that I like in general, but here's in a nutshell, what this is talking about. Positive earnings announcement drift is a market inefficiency. It's something we can see. We can observe it over decades of time. It's there. It's objectively there. What happens is a company has a beat or miss of a certain magnitude. So the way you would express this, if a company is in the top decile of beats or quintile 10 or 20% of reports, and they have a beat that exceeds 10% or more, they become candidates for positive earnings announcement drift. And what that is, is outsized returns that happen over the next quarter. You can do this without options. If you see a company that has really strong earnings, and then it has the right criteria, meaning typically smaller companies now, it used to be every company, but because more people are familiar with this inefficiency, it starts to get priced out. So it's smaller companies now. So if Meta or if Apple have a big beat, it doesn't mean that they can't experience post earnings announcement drift. It means that it's dampened. But if you have a mid cap, small cap stock that does, you can clearly observe this. So they have this big beat post earnings. Then over the next quarter, they go on to have excess returns more often than not. So really, and again, you can check out this research. There's a really simple way to capitalize that. Post earnings move, track that quarter earnings, find the top decile beats, buy them. Come back later, done. That, it literally works, it still works. That is just an example of a market inefficiency. This is predicated on insufficient pricing. It takes too long. Tessa says, I use earning whispers that help tell you if it beats expectations or not. Yeah, you can use something like earnings whispers, depending on what trading platform you have. There are a bunch of different ways you can do it. So like, for example, on something like this, Palantir, which is one of the trades we're going to talk about. It was estimated at four cents. It came in at eight cents. If I were a betting man, which I am because I trade, if I'm a betting man trying to find where I can look for excess returns, this is on the short list. I had a position on in here, which again, we'll talk about, I'm not in it still, but I still would wager over the next quarter, based on this movement alone, this will have excess returns. And it's not gonna work every single time. Sometimes it won't work. That is the nature of trading. It's a law of large numbers game. Now we'll get into a little bit later, how you can use something like options to amplify this effect, but as I'm saying up front, you don't have to use options. You could literally just buy the underlying itself. Question. Um, yeah. So are you using the system where they, the company beats earnings by a certain amount, beats earnings estimates, and has a certain minimum stock move uh, to the upside to qualify? That's exactly right. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. So you want to you want to look for um, the basis for post earnings announcement drift is on the earnings per share expectation versus what it was. But you want to find the strongest performers on that news. And it has changed because I've traded PEED for a long time now, and it absolutely has changed, meaning you have to pay kind of close attention to the size of the company and then the institutional support behind the company. But yeah, this will go through. The cool thing about this paper and the reason why I refer people to this paper is because of this. Um, it essentially summarizes a lot of post earnings announcement drift research so that then you can see the summary from a bunch of different research and like with all of these kinds of research papers i won't bore you with all the details if you go down to the bottom you can see all of the different papers they researched so then you can go dig into those and say hey maybe there's an idea but the traits have changed a bit but in a nutshell ian that's exactly correct mm -hmm. yep so that's an example though of structural alpha. Nothing too crazy, pretty simple. There's a bunch of examples of those things that exist if you know where to look. Another one is with bond products, we call it the window dressing trade, where partway through the month, a lot of companies will rotate into bonds so that their products exhibit certain volatility. Performance, when I say um, funds, I'm typically referring to hedge funds, mutual funds, products that are reporting out to shareholders or just private clientele that they have their money from. And you can find excess returns in trades like that. The reason why I'm bringing these things up is because there are different ways to make money in the stock market, as most of you probably know. So we can trade market directions. Something can go up, down, sideways. You can trade all of those with options. And one of the coolest things about options is we'll get into a specific example later, but if you apply options to help amplify and create leverage around directional assumptions, exactly what you can get is a leveraged return. You can also have lower risk on that leverage trading options. Now, not all that glitters is gold. And when I talk about something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So there are downfalls when it comes to options. We'll touch on some of those later. But in this really simple example, if you wanted to gain a hundred, if you wanted to gain exposure to a hundred shares of Apple, you could buy Apple outright, which is pretty expensive right now, or you can buy a call at a fraction of the price. Again, we're going to go through an example with Palantir that kind of displays this trait. But this is just a way to create a leveraged version of this position. The next thing we're talking about is hedging risk. This is actually the entire reason why options were born. If you go back literally to the beginning of derivatives in general, it is predicated around minimizing risk. So I think, actually, I'm curious. I have to look. Give me one second. So the first option that was around was in 350 BC. This is from my trading plan. Actually, I keep a bunch of notes in my trading plan and there's one of them. It's from Thales and the Olive Harvest. So in the 350 BC, Aristotle essentially talked about the first known options contract that we can think of where he bought the rights to an olive press and it ended up paying out in the future. Again, it's kind of a more details than that, but you guys aren't here for a lesson on Aristotle's purchase of a olive press from 350 BC. But it's something I find generally humor. The other thing you can do with options that becomes difficult with equities is trading all market directions. Equities work really well to the upside. Guess what? There is another market inefficiency here. Well, it's not so much an efficiency, it's more of an anomaly. There's kind of different classifications of these things, but equities exhibit positive drift. That means in the long run, if you buy equities, they tend to go up, positive drift. That is an anomaly. That's something you can take advantage of as a trader. People who interact with buy and hold investments, that's what they're doing. Now, with options though, you can trade everything up, down, sideways. It's all on the table for us. For some people, that can be a little overwhelming because you now have more choices available to you. 
But it's actually a really beautiful trade of options that once you understand how to employ them, it can help you fill gaps in your profile. When I'm looking at trading, in my trading, I went through this really interesting curve where I didn't know anything and I traded the couple strategies that I know, a beginner strategy, very common, like verticals. Not a big fan of them, but it's common. Then I started trying everything under the sun. I tried pretty much every strategy I could conceive of, and I was finding that I wasn't making super great progress. And then now, kind of where I'm currently trading, I have a handful of strategies that I've defined over a decade and a half that allow me to trade any market condition. Equities, you can trade up or down, and you can find opportunities in most market conditions to go up or down, but sometimes it's useful to have another tool for the toolkit, and that's where options can step in. And another version of this is to be able to trade volatility. And again, I told you this is a big thing options traders talk a lot about. It's because they're integral to options, the concept of volatility and implied volatility and forecast volatilities. We're not going to get into all that just yet, but just know that you have equities. I'm going to call you back. And I'm, just, I'm just dealing with something. Uh, I'm thinking about 45 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's somebody that is off mute that didn't realize it. Cool. It looks like we're good. Um, but yeah, they def you should give them a call back. But going back to volatility here. So volatility, it's quite literally its own asset class. It has its own behaviors. And one of the cool things about it is once you understand how volatility behaves, there are different trade thesis you can develop to trade a completely separate asset class. When we're thinking about trading, you can have correlated returns, uncorrelated or inversely correlated returns and non-correlated returns. Again, depending on what your objectives are, but let me show you something. If we look at something like the VIX, and I zoom out really far, I go out five years, what do you notice? Well, the first thing I notice is that sometimes it goes up a lot, but it always comes back down. Pretty simple, relatively straightforward assumption. What does that tell me? Well, two things. One, it seems like when volatility tends to go up, it tends to go up with some serious velocity. What does it mean to the inverse when it comes down? It tends to come down pretty quick. The other thing I notice is that it always comes down. This is tradable. This is all tradable for you. And options can help give you direct exposure to these kinds of things. Income, this one is give or take options are good for income to be clear but i'm just not necessarily saying that they would be better than having a solid dividend paying portfolio that's ladder that's giving you dividends you know on a regular basis but you can use options absolutely for income and the cool part about options as compared to something like a dividend paying stock is that you can combine them you don't have to pick one or the other you can have a really solid dividend paying stock that you also choose to sell options against that's fine Traders, you'll notice in general, they, I don't know why, I think it's because we kind of have a, a herd mentality to a degree, but we tend to like pick a camp, right? Oh, I buy stocks. Oh, I sell stocks. Most people forget to just be traders. And all I'm saying that for is to remember, there are instances where options can make a lot of sense. There are instances where options might not make that much sense and it would be better to trade something else. But the good part of all of this is that you don't have to pick one you can look at a circumstance and see what best fits we'll talk a little bit about this maybe in a future session if there's interest in developing kind of some strategies for using options for income it's something that i do now and it's completely viable but this can also be paired with dividend strategies and the last thing here structural alpha we started talking about this already options can give you exposure to structural alpha in many different ways Again, we don't have to go super far into that concept just yet. It's a little bit early, but I just want you to know that when you're trading something like equities, you can gain exposure to structural alpha via positive drift, positive earn post earnings announcement drift, those kinds of things. But with options, there's even more instances where that is a thing. So these are some use cases for options. A couple questions for you guys. First off, before we started going through this, how many of these use cases were you aware of? How do you think options fit into a portfolio, if at all? I'm just curious how you guys think about options.
Tessa says for her, just number four, which is trading volatility. I think that that's good, to be honest. A lot of options traders, they don't realize that you can trade it for volatility. So that's a solid one. Oh, sorry, Eric. I meant um, I was aware of the first five. Sorry. I just wasn't aware of structural alpha. Mm, okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's still good. Yeah, because a lot of traders, they don't realize that volatility is a viable asset class for us. It behaves different, but in my opinion, that's actually kind of a good thing because it gives you another source of returns. So what I want to do now is take a look at a recent trade that I had on just to walk through some of how it played out. And then I want to get into these last two buckets. So let's take a look at this trade. Don't worry about all this stuff on the left hand side. Also, you are welcome to admire my handwriting. It's known to be really good. There's actually a couple jokes. It's it's a relic of the YouTube channel now that my handwriting is so awful. I used to I switched to writing everything out and then people made fun of me for caving and writing everything out in like uh, typing. So now I just make them suffer through stuff you can't read. But here's what happened. I was trading not originally but I came across Palantir. I trade earnings. And there was a couple things about Palantir that really stood out to me. And this is not a, any sort of recommendation for the stock. You have to figure out how you feel about different stocks. That's the cool part about trading is I'm really just focusing on moves. I don't really care too much about the product itself. I'm just following what price is doing. So post earnings, I saw a big jump. For those that don't know, it moved something to the tune of 30% and I can grab, I got to move the chat over here and I can grab a tool just so you know when I'm looking over there, it's just because I have another screen over there. And no, I'm not one of those traders that feels like I need to have a bunch of screens. I have three screens, one of them, so I can have YouTube on full size. So you, you don't need that. I'm just, but let's take a look at pounds here. And Let's take a quick look at a few things. This is the last earnings cycle we had. These are earnings. So this little area here is what the implied move was, what the options pricing were expecting Palantir to move, and here's what it did do, as you could tell. I didn't trade Palantir for earnings. That's for a lot of reasons that we don't have to go into, but it boils down to, if I look how it typically behaves around earnings, it's not good from at least a options trading perspective. Now, notice down here, the implied move was 14%. It came in at like 31%. That is a massive change between implied move and the actual move. Then if we couple the next fact that we found from before, that it was expected at 4 cents came in at 8 cents, doubled the expected. That's interesting to me. This tells me innately structural alpha could be here. I fully expect to be able to at least monitor if there's post earnings announcement drift in this case to the positive side. Now, one other thing I want to highlight, notice this previous earnings back here. In this example, it moved 20% post earnings. It was estimated at 17 cents came in at seven. So right out of the gate, this isn't a candidate for PED. The other thing is notice the volume on this move. Nothing too crazy. When I hover over, I'm seeing 170 million shares. When I look at this most recent earnings, I see 421 million shares. Three things I see there that make me interested now. Doubled EPS expectations, 30% positive move, four times the last earnings volume. Curious. So time to put on a trade, pretty simple. This is a rundown of the rules that I'm applying. So the trade that I use is called a ratio called diagonal. The way you can think about this is if you buy in equity, your long shares. This case, I'm long a call that's essentially serving as a replacement for the shares. And I'll explain to you why. This is just some general rules about the trade, where I was expecting it to go to, what my original loss taking was, that kind of stuff. And this is the details on the trade, how it fits with the portfolio. These are all just kind of standard fare for how I'm positioning a trade before it goes on.
but I want to specifically show you some details. You already saw this, so we don't have to rehash that. I just kind of have a highlighted part down there for you. And these are a couple things that I want us to keep in mind as we go through the rest of the position that I generated. But here is the position as it went on. I bought 50, and most of this, to be clear, is going to sound like uh, another language, and that's by design. I'm purposely using the nomenclature I would use to start getting people familiar with hearing it. I'm going to explain all of it, so don't worry about it. But just listen, at least as we go through this first part. So I bought to open 50. This is the beginning part of the trade. So you can buy to open or sell to open. That's your two choices. Same thing with equities. You buy an equity to open, you're hoping it goes higher. If you sell an equity to open, you're hoping it goes lower. Same thing here. So in this case, bought to open 50. So this is the number of contracts that I purchased. The way to think about options contracts is they work in 100 multiples. So each one of these contracts represents 100 shares of Palantir stock. So in this case, these are the expirations, the 19 April, 19 call. This is called the strike price, which again, you don't have to worry about that just yet. This is what I paid for, and this is what I paid out. It was a $13,000 debit. And then this is some short calls against that position. Think of it as like a ratio covered call, which we'll get into that in just a few minutes. This is the base position. So what ended up, this is what the P&L structure for that position looks like. You'll notice that I have unlimited upside potential, and then I have risk to the downside. So it's very similar to a covered call. This is what it ended up doing. On the 14th of February, I exited the whole position and it came out to just over $13,000 in profit. So this was a eight day trade that really followed a heavy trend. So now what I want us to take a look at is how does this then compare to if we take a look at long option versus long shares. And we're gonna go through an example together. Before I do that, I'm gonna take a pause. Are there any questions on what we've seen so far? Any questions on the thesis? Any questions on the structure of the trade? You don't have to know all the details. It's early for that. The main thing I want to come across is that this is a bullish trade that I'm using options for leverage. That's really the high level summary. But any questions other than that? We look happy, so it makes me happy. Let's take a look then at comparing these. I'm gonna start with using the same amount of capital in both trades. So in this case, with the long option, I paid $13,000, it got me 50 lots, which we'll talk about what the notional size of that is in a second. If I had $13,000 applied to the trade, when Palantir was at 20, right before earnings, that would get me about 650 shares. Cool. So then what's the notional value here? Simple. For the long shares, there's no change. It is what it is. You already paid it outright. There's no leverage here. With the long option, on this $13,000, I'm actually controlling $95,000 worth of Palantir. This is the leverage. There is no free lunch in the markets. There's a cost to this leverage. When we buy or sell an option, all of them have an expiration date. That means it has to do something by that date. It's either going to be what we would call in the money or out of the money. Again, don't have to worry about what those terms are just yet, but just know that if it's out of the money and it expires there, there's no value. It is gone, got nothing. So what that would mean is if I bought this and I held it to expiration and Palantir was not trading above my strike, above 19, and I held it all the way through expiration, I would lose all of this. It would be gone. So what's the difference then compared to the long shares? It wouldn't be gone. You would still have the shares. So that's the cost. When we think about buying options, is you are typically buying protection or buying leverage, but it has an expiration. And it's important to be mindful of that. 
So when you think about options trading, especially when it comes to stuff like this, where I'm looking to discretionarily trade options to create excess returns, not only do you have to be correct, you have to be correct in the right amount of time. Otherwise, you're wrong. So if something goes in your favor, but it takes too long, go wrong. It's important to think about that because there are ways you can structure these to then minimize that. There's a reason why I picked seven, or 17, 19 April. That's a ways away from now. It gives me time. What's the trade-off for doing that? Well, it's more expensive than buying something with a shorter term expiration. So everything in trading has some sort of trade-off. Now I want to show you a couple other things. This is looking at the profit and loss if you were long the option or long the shares at two different price points. The profit point would be at 25 the loss point would be at 19. So in this case, when I look at how the position performed, I see at 25, meaning if it goes in my direction, with the long option, I would make 19,850 bucks. With the long shares, you make three grand. Again, that sounds great. Why wouldn't we use options then? Well, because if you lose, in this case, if pounds here fell down to 19, you would be down. In this case, you would lose 2,900 bucks. And in this case, you would just be down 632. So what's the lesson here? Leverage giveth and leverage taketh. You have to create a solid understanding and relationship with leverage. Because in this case, you had 6.8 times reward to risk in this case. So overall, it's a well-structured trade. In this case, you had 4.7. So I still would take the risk reward in this case. And if this number is too big, guess what? I don't have to trade 50, trade less. But you have to be aware of how these things behave. So if I come over here now to the platform, I just want to give you one other view to help you guys see what this looks like. So in this case, this is looking at just being long that 19 call at $2.26, which is the basis I had. And you can see what it looks like. Notice how to the downside, it's flat. These do not have unlimited downside risk. When you buy an option, if it's a single option, you're gonna have capped risk, whatever you bought the option for. With equities, a little different. It's just kind of like this diagonal line. So different risk to reward profiles. And that's kind of the whole point of options is they allow you to build the desired risk to reward profile. Hi, Any Eric, questions? Um, yeah, talk to me. Yes, can you go back to that graph and maybe most people have not seen that risk graph and just really quickly go over like what's on a, the different axes. Great, Paul, sorry about that. Thank you very much. So yeah. Th yeah, this is known as a risk profile and it tells you, drum roll please, the profile of your risk. So all that means is it takes whatever your position is and it plots it out. This X axis down here, are different prices for the underlying that you're looking at. So as you can see in this example, this centerpiece, the center vertical line right here is marked at 24.29. So that's showing you the current price of Palantir and then what the PL is at that price. The Y axis represents the PL. So this dotted line here is the zero line. Anything above that is a profit. Anything below that would be a loss. And right now I have it structured to provide to me two kind of additional bands. This just represents minus one and plus one standard deviation with respect to price. So this is a way for traders to kind of more easily visualize how their positions behave in conjunction with one another, especially as you start building them out and so that you can compare them. You can do all of this in Excel or in Python if you're so inclined. You can calculate the PL for all of these things. In this case, it's really just a little bit easier to view it here, which is why I show it like this. Any questions yeah, on the PL? Yeah, so yeah, yeah and I just wanted to point out is that you know you can see uh, so the the what's it called the, the angled um, line mm -hmm. right there that is at expiration. And so does that mean, so what we're seeing here is that the way you structured this, Eric, is that 
the 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 most that you can lose is ten thousand. It will not go below ten thousand. That's your max loss. But on the other side, you have infinite upside. Is that what yep. it's saying basically? Yep, that's correct. So that's another good call out. You'll notice that there's two lines. And if you look in the bottom left, there's two different dates. The top date is 19 February, which if you're astute, you'll realize that that is today. And then the blue line says 20 April, and that is at expiration. That is the expiration of the option. So you'll notice that there's a gap between these, and there's actually a reason for that. Because remember how I told you that options decay? Well, right now, up here, you'll see that I can fast forward the date. I'm going to do that for you. And I want you to pay attention to what happens with this purple line. I'm zooming in to make it a little more clear. I'm going to click this real fast. Watch that purple line. I have to click it super quick. Oh, this is already eight. my bad. This is using expiration. I need to click a different one. This one down here. My bad. Okay, watch that purple line. Real this time. Notice what it's doing. As we get closer and closer to expiration, we're losing time value. So that's why that purple line is approximating to the blue line at expiration. So the reason why you have to be aware of that is, again, because when you trade options, you are quite literally trading a decaying asset. And you have to be prepared to handle that decay. There are ways you can minimize it, which, again, that would be a subject for a future session at the end of this video. I have a couple homework items for you all, and one of them will kind of help explain some of this, I believe. But that's the trade. Now, there's a couple other things I wanted to cover with you all quickly, and we have about five minutes, which is perfect. So I want to give you a crash course super quick on options. And as you'll notice, options are derivatives, which I think I'm going to slide this down so it's not in the way for you guys. Go. So options are derivatives. That simply means that they're products whose value is derived from something else. It's predicated on something. So when we're talking about options in the context of Palantir, all of the options and all of the behavior and the price of options, they are slaved specifically to Palantir stock. Tessa says we have one and a half hours in case you have time. Yeah, I, I totally do. I just want to make sure I'm not running too far over on you guys. Um, so the way that I try to help people understand options is I use the deed to a house as a surrogate. So if you think about the deed to a house, it is just a piece of paper and it has no inherent value to it. It's just a piece of paper. However, that piece of paper gives the holder of the deed the right to an asset, in this case, a house, very similar with options. So there are another form of derivatives. They're called futures. They behave differently. They have a different lifespan and different products that they will track. That's outside the scope of this conversation, but you should know that they're there. And there are actually way more derivatives that are out there, things like swaps, those are typically done between institutions, hybrids, institutions, stuff that you won't really see. From the retail trader side, there's two things that typically concern us, options and futures. So we are focusing on options. Another couple things to note when it comes to options is that the contract to an option has some specific traits. And we talked about some of them already. Believe it or not, you are further along in your understanding of options than you may realize. So when we talk about options that it has these traits, we'll go over all these in a second, but I really want to highlight this point for you guys right here. They are contracts between two people. So that means there is a counterparty to every single trade you put on. Now, question, who do you think that counterparty is? Does anybody know? So if you choose to buy an option, sell an option, who typically is on the other side of that trade? Any ideas? The market maker? Yeah. The, the vast majority of the time, it's going to be a liquidity provider of some sort. So the way orders are routed in a nutshell, again, not going to go into market structure, but just so you have an idea of how this works. When you click the button, 
to place a trade, buy or sell, it's going to go to your broker. If you have a broker dealer, they'll look to see if they can fill that order inside in the house. Then they're going to route it externally. More often than not, it's going to go to a wholesaler like Citadel, Virtu, KCG. And then after it goes to the wholesaler, it'll route it to the exchange and then it'll get filled at the exchange. They have a matchmaking algorithm that tries to pair you with another counterparty. And the vast majority of the time, that counterparty is going to be a market maker. So it's a bit of a process to get orders to move. And again, there are some nuances to be aware of as you deepen your understanding, not just of options, but of just trading. But just know that that's the general route. Now, there's another big item that we have to handle up front, which is we know that there's two people with specific terms. So that tells us inherently that there's a buyer and a seller. So the buyer purchases the right to do something, and then the sellers receive money to then provide whatever that something is. We'll get into the difference between if you buy a call or buy a put, what that means for you, but just know that anytime you hear the term buy, they have the right not an obligation. Sellers do not have a right, they have the obligation, the on the other side of that trade. Now, common nomenclature, just in case I slide between them and you're unfamiliar, if somebody says buy, that's one way. You could say long, that's another way to say that. Same thing for selling, you can sell or you can short something, that's to sell. And with typical stock market parlance, it's designed to be super confusing and not user friendly. So you can buy a product that's short the market in terms of a disposition, you can be have a long or short disposition. Long disposition means you want it to go up. Short disposition means you want it to go down. Or you can use it to classify a transaction. If I say I'm I'm long 50 shares or 50 contracts of Palantir, it means I've bought them. So yeah, it's there just to confuse you because the market has nothing better to do with its time. Now, when we look at the five key aspects, you know some of these. The underlying, this is whatever the product is, that the option is tied to. DTE is days to expiration. How long is this option good for? We know all options expire. The strike price, think of this as the sale price of the house. What is the price that we're agreeing to do whatever it is we're doing? The premium is the value of an option and then the type, calls or puts. So what I wanna do real quick is take a look at an options chain and show you those. Any question first before we dive too far into this piece? Any questions on any of these? Cool. Let's take a look at an options chain. So we'll keep rolling with Palantir because we're here. And you'll notice that there are all of these different expirations. You'll notice that some of them are kind of yellow and some of them are gray. This is a non-standard expiration, and then this is a standard expiration. Standard option expiration is the third Friday of the month, and that's these gray ones. These will all be on a Friday. These will all be the third Friday of the month. Then these, as you can see, it's even telling you to highlight it more clearly, but these are weeklies. What you'll find is there are very liquid products like SPY, and notice how many kind of colored expirations there are, these gold ones, tons of them. And it's because they have a lot of non-standard expirations, just something to be aware of. Now, if we click into one of these, there are a bunch of things that pop up. On the left-hand side here, we have calls. On the right-hand side, we have puts. Calls appreciate in value when the underlying goes up. So if SPY in this instance goes up, all of these calls will appreciate in value to some degree. How much? Well, you can actually calculate that once we get into things like the Greeks. You don't have to worry about that now. The main thing to take away is as SPY or any underlying goes up, calls go up. If the underlying goes up, puts then depreciate in value. They lose value. So what does that inherently tell you about the difference between calls and puts? They're kind of juxtaposed to one another. They move inversely to one another. 
So then we can take the next logical step and we can say, okay, if SPY then goes down, what do you think happens to the value of puts if SPY goes down? Any guesses? Any brave souls? Check in the chat. They, they obviously, uh, the, the value of the option goes up if the price of the stock goes down. Bingo. If you're, yeah. is that what you are? You, yes. Yep. That's 100% correct. Yep. So they just move inverse to one another. So now there's one other thing we have to understand between calls and puts is so then we know what it happens with value in terms of the premium. But what do these actually give you rights to? Well, we need to understand that next. So calls give the buyer the right, not the obligation, to purchase shares at whatever that strike price is by a specific date. So going back to the example that I gave you guys before, I told you that I bought 50 of the Palantir calls that expired on 19 April. So if we go out here to 19 April and I bought 50 of these 19 calls. So that tells us that I'm able to then, I have the right to purchase that number of shares of Palantir at this price, regardless of where Palantir goes. So the way that this starts to make sense is I bought these before Palantir went up a whole bunch. So at this point, I don't have the position still on, but if I did, it means that even though Palantir is trading at 2444, I could buy the shares at 19. I can get them much cheaper than what they're at in the market. That's kind of the whole idea. Now, when we're talking about options and the settlement of options, there's, and this is just so you like a little cheat sheet for you guys to um, grab a screenshot of if you would like. But if we think about how an option then is settled, you don't have to exercise your options. So there's a couple things we can do with options. We can trade them, meaning buy or sell them if they're an American style option. American means that you can exercise your option at any point that you would like. European style options can still be traded in and out of, but they can only be exercised at expiration. Big difference, most products you're going to see on the marketplace are going to be American style options, but there are lots of European style options like SPX, the index, that is European style, can't be exercised early. The other thing to keep in mind is the way things can be settled. When an option is exercised, it means shares are moving somewhere. So if I exercise a call, it means that I am buying shares. If I exercise a put, it means I am offloading shares. That's the difference between these two. The other thing to consider when it comes to the settlement of options is in general, it's easier and more efficient to simply trade the option itself. So if you choose to move shares as the buyer, you can, you have that choice. But more often than not, there's a more efficient expression, which is simply if you bought an option that's gone up in value, you can just sell the option. There's no problem there. The other thing to remember is most options when we're talking about with relation to specific underlyings, they tend to have shares that can move. But if we're talking about something like SPX, you'll notice something. If I go over here, and we look at the volume, it has no volume. SPX has no volume. Why is that? Because it's an index. There's no actual underlying here. So all of these options are tied to this index, but there's no index. I mean, I'm sorry, there's no shares. So if there's just an index and no shares, what happens at expiration? These are cash settled. So it means that if you take these all the way to expiration, you then, there's no shares that can transact if it's exercised, so it settles to cash. So if we recap all of this quickly, options are derivatives. They are contracts between two people with specific terms. The buyers 
have the right, not the obligation to do something. The sellers have the obligation. They have these key components. There's an underlying that they're tied to, a specific expiration. They have a strike price. They have a, a value assigned to it known as the premium. And then they're either gonna be a call or a put. If we're talking about calls, the buyer has the right to purchase things. If we're talking about puts, the buyer has the right to sell things. The seller in both of these instances has the inverse obligation to the buyer. That is options in a nutshell, a handful of minutes. A lot of these things will be brand new terms to you. Not expected that you would fully understand all of them. What I would recommend for people, if you're interested in learning more about options, there's a great book. I'm not affiliated with these guys at all. It's probably my favorite options trading book called Options as a Strategic Investment. They do a beautiful job running through an overview. I also have some basic 101 videos, but I honestly think the book does a way better job than I do. So that's what I would divert you towards. But I want to give you at least a working understanding of what these things are. So are there any questions on kind of the general construction? Yeah, talk to me. I have two questions. So um, can you explain in, in, in really less words um, what this means when the people speak about zero DTE? So when this came uh, into the market before the market closed, all the people speak about zero DTE options. What does it mean in detail? Yeah, so it's a great question. And I have a couple um, studies I can also refer to you on. But zero DTE simply means people are trading options that expire today. So the market didn't trade today. You'll notice that there's a 20 Feb expiration in SPX. So tomorrow, those will be zero DTE. And I will also trade those tomorrow, very likely. And then the next day, when we go to 21 Feb, that will be zero DTE. So simply put, zero DTE is when it's an expiration for today. And a lot of people trade zero DTE options. Funny enough, the vast majority of retail trader volume is now going into zero DTE. That's for a bunch of different reasons. We can dive into that if you'd like, but that's what it is in a nutshell. Okay. Let me see if I can grab that. This. It's kind of one of those things that I'm slightly embarrassed about where there's a lot of tickers that I know off the top of my head and I'm getting to the point where like I can kind of pull these studies up in the same way. I'm not sure that that's a good thing. But this study is beautiful because it talks about retail trader volume. The way we identify retail trader volume is by slim options. And that's just a kind of price improvement mechanism. It's us able to track 10, things that are less than 10 lots, typically retail traders, smaller retail traders. And if you take a look at this here, monthly retail trading volume, notice zero DTE as a percentage of the total trading volume. Look at it back in 2021, uh, less than maybe a quarter, if that. And if you look at it towards the summer of last year, it's the majority of it. So all of this is showing you is that people are trading a ton of zero DTEs. Notice on a monthly um, relative value, the amount that's going into zero DTE, it's the vast majority. And again, there's a lot of reasons for this, but you can see the expansion of zero DTE volume over time. They've become really interesting to traders. The high level summary of that is again, if you think about the majority of traders, a lot of them are not systematic. They're not thoughtful about what they're doing. They're hoping for quick money quickly, like we talked about earlier. So they are under the illusion that they'll get that in zero DTE, which very frequently, they will not. Uh, Tessa says, I'm curious to see who your experience with options. Zero DTE is basically like day trading options. Yep, that's exactly right. So there are use cases. And again, from a structural alpha standpoint for more sophisticated traders like myself, they're very interesting to me because I'm looking for volatility and they have a lot of volatility in zero DTE options. And it's because it forces the dealers, the people who tend to be on the other side of the trades, they have a lot of hedging that they have to do. It expires the same day. There's kind of a lot of structural components to that that's probably a bit boring to the group here. But the high level summary of that is there's opportunity there for people that are interested in short-term options. I trade them very frequently. Thank you. Good question.
Yeah, of course. So the last thing I have for us then is an overview of some misconceptions. And I'm actually curious what your, what your guys' thoughts are on these. So if you were to think about how risky options are compared to equities, would we classify them as more risky, less risky, same risky? Any ideas? And I'm sliding the chat over here. Rob, this is less. Doesn't it depend on the strategy that you've selected? Couldn't agree more. I think that's exactly it. So I have to apologize to all of you. I phrased that question very purposefully to kind of set you guys up for failure, which is to approach it as a binary answer. And Ian very thoughtfully read between the lines there. Very few things in trading are binary. There are instances where options can absolutely be more risky. There are plenty of instances where options can absolutely be less risky. And you can always turn to really simple places like Reddit to see, in this case, you know, they had a 98% drawdown on their position. So that doesn't look great. And this person is also from Reddit and they've lost 40% of their account, oops, in a day. Also not great. So options can absolutely be risky. There's no doubt. However, if you structure them thoughtfully, they can actually do a pretty solid job at reducing risk for us. So the next one, our options are easy money. I think we all know this already. Funny enough, this was, I grabbed this before the session, which is that study we were just looking at together. And it's a screenshot from there. And as you can see, the percentage of profitable traders, again, this is a different study than what I cited earlier, the day trader study, but it's about right where it's, you know, 95% are not profitable, kind of living in this zone. And there's a group that are occasionally profitable, but there's a small group that are. And when you think about the overall volume that's profitable, it's also quite low. So all of this here is to say that options objectively are not easy money. And it's important to know that. The next thing that you'll hear all the time is most options expire worthless. And I purposefully put this in front of people. This is from the OIC, which is an uh, institution that essentially provides mandates on options. And you'll notice that less, or I'm sorry, more than 72% of options are closed prior to expiration. So the majority are closed before expiration. Then there are 22% that expire without value, 6% get exercised. All of this is to say, if you look for options, you're gonna see no shortage of heuristics online that talks about stuff like, does theta decay provide an edge? Is buying better than selling or vice versa? And the fact is, it's just not how it works. There are instances where one might be better than the other. There are instances where theta might help your position or might hurt your position but it doesn't inherently provide an edge. And a lot of times that you'll see people talking about selling options, this is their rationale because most of it in their mind expire worthless. I, I'm actually, I literally just read a book. I am probably the most avid consumer of options trading books and I buy all the shitty ones too. And I bought a really bad one the other day that has decent reviews, but there's a section in there where this person is talking about their method for tra trading options. And they say this exact thing that most options expire worthless. It's just not true. It's a heuristic that people purport, but it's not right. Less than a quarter of them expire worthless. And it's important to know that because it just reminds us that there are a use case for options. And then sometimes they might not be right. And then the last thing I wanted to cover is this one, since we already talked about these bottom two, which is, Options are primarily for short-term trading. I get that a lot too. And I grabbed an options chain, which you guys are all familiar with now. And you'll notice that there's expirations out to 868 days. Not super long-term, that's not decades, but that's still a pretty dang long time for a position. The point being is not all options are these really short duration positions. You can structure them to be pretty much whatever you want, which is the beauty of them. So those are some common misconceptions. I will take a pause there now. That brings me to kind of the end of the big ticket items. I'd love to 
answer any questions or have any conversations if there's something that you all want to look at or something that you've heard. And then at the end of that, I have a couple homework items for those interested, and then that'll wrap us up. But we'll start with any questions, or is there something you want to look at? Is there something that you've heard that you're curious if it's accurate? Any of those kinds of things, I would love to dive into those. I have a question again, I mean, but this is more, yeah. more advanced. So sorry for the other one for confusing. So do you have any idea what has happened if you have an options position and the stock get delisted. So when we have the regional bank issue, I remember there was someone of our community member in an options trade, but the stock was halted and never opened again. So our options trader therefore protected or not? It depends on what you mean by protected. So they have no additional protections over the equity itself. Typically there will be some sort of settlement value associated with them. And you might get the value of that, you might not. The way that you would be protected is if you bought the option, then you already know what your downside is. It's whatever you bought it for. So you're protected in that sense. If you oh, yeah. sold the option, if you sold the option, you are probably not super happy because you were waiting to see whatever the settlement value is that you might be on the hook for, which is a terrible, terrible feeling, which goes all the way back to whenever we're trading options, it is absolutely unequivocally mandated to trade solid products that are liquid. Mm -hmm. the propensity for big stocks and stuff like that to get delisted. So like, for example, Twitter, when Twitter got bought out, big stock, a lot of people trading it, there was ample opportunity to exit it before it was delisted. If somebody chooses to hold up until that point, it could be a crapshoot. It could be tough to see, yeah, exactly how it pans out. It's a fun question though. It's actually mm -hmm. something I'll, I'll, I'll take a note on because I haven't, I, again, kind of a nerd over this stuff. So, but I haven't done any discrete research on like the propensity of what the settlement value is for different options if a stock is delisted and I haven't seen any data on it. So I would be curious to see if there's an aggregate view of that. I'll take a look at that. Any other uh, yeah. questions? A few people had to drop off, but um... You know, we could take questions after as well, right, Eric? Yeah, of course. If there's anything if that you think email of, email you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you guys are 100% more than welcome to. So then, what I'm gonna do is give you guys a couple pieces of homework. The very first one is again, I'm not affiliated with them, but if you are interested in options, I think options as a strategic investment should be purchased. I just think it's probably one of the best holistic books that you can grab. I have a copy here. As you can tell, I actually have a few, I give them to people, but it's, it's massive. It's just, it's a big textbook. So the cool part is, is it serves as a really, really solid reference book for this kind of stuff. And so that's the first thing is if you're interested in learning about options, that is hands down the direction I would send you. The second thing is if you're interested in options, I will grab kind of a 101 video that I have. I'll throw it in the chat. And the video, I, it's long. I am try to do it all in one shot, so I didn't edit it a bunch. But the idea is to give you some more background on some of the things that we talked about today with respect to options. So that's the video I just dropped in now. The video is like an hour and 20 minutes long. I literally just shot it one way through, which is nuts. But that aside, I think the next thing to take a look at for you all is hopefully we have a trading plan. In that trading plan, I think it would be really good to start a section, one, outlining, outlining your notes on options, two, outlining what you think your use case could be for options. Because for the people that are on any future sessions for this, we'll review some of those and we'll talk about specifically how we can integrate those. And then the last thing I have for you, there's two next learning steps when it comes to options, in my opinion. The first one would be learning Greeks. The second one would be volatility. So I'm throwing those out there. If you want to start doing some preemptive research, Investopedia has absolutely great material. That video that I dropped in there, we'll talk about both of those. And the last thing, 
is there are three strategies that I think make the most sense for equities traders to discretionarily apply options. Now, this is my opinion. Again, grain of salt. This is not a mandate. This is not something that you should overvalue. But I think ratio diagonals is the first strategy I would start to explore. The coverage strangle is the second strategy I would start to explore. And then a ratio covered call. Third strategy I would look to explore. So you have your homework. Options as a strategic investment. Check that book out. Start doing some homework on Greeks and volatility. Again, when it comes to learning options, it's all a foreign language. So I would highly recommend you guys to not get too overwhelmed or too dissuaded when you see a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense, you're not sure what it is, that's going to be there. It's learning a new language. So one of the best ways to do that successfully is by just inundating yourself with the language. Like if I'm, when I was in Africa, I was in Tanzania, the way that I started learning to speak Swahili was being around people that were speaking Swahili. It's a really effective way to learn a language. So kind of same thing here, be around the language. Don't worry too much about all of the fine details up front, but just kind of filter what you're hearing and then go from there. Tessa is recapping. Yep. So options is a strategic investment. That's exactly right. It's by Lawrence McMillan. Then check out that 101 video. Yep. Update your trading plan. Check out Greeks and volatility. Yep. Which is in that video. And then there, there are those three strategies. I'll give you links to my flavor of those three strategies to make it easy. So the first link that's coming through, this one is for the coverage triangle. The next one is going to be for ratio diagonals. Uh, and then the last one will be about the ratio covered. And I'm kind of giving a shortcut version of some of these different strategies, just because I think, I think in general, for equities traders, these would be most applicable. And then we could get into things like, again, hedging a portfolio. The problem with hedging a portfolio is you have to be really thoughtful about how we do that, but we can talk about that in the future. But yeah, that is the near-term homework for everybody. Can I ask Fantastic. again? Can I ask yeah. again? Um, three questions. You can only choose. I'm really um, thinking what, what do you show? Uh, in the money or out the money? Completely contextual dependent. There is no answer for that. <laughs> High data, so that's, low data. <laughs> yeah, so so that's kind of like saying, would you rather breathe air or drink water? <laughs> like, you need the both. Yeah. <laughs> the problem with moneyness is, is it is entirely dependent on the strategy. So like, if I'm trading a ratio diagonal, the base of that position is deep in the money. But if I'm selling a cash secured put, that's out of the money. I'm not going to sell that deep in the money. So yeah, I, I think it would be disingenuous to pick one because it is completely contextual. Okay, well, what do you prefer uh, most? Uh, in, um, out the money or in the money? It's completely, it's based on the strategy. So like for the covered strangle, I almost always sell the cash secured puts out of the money. That's where they make the most sense for that strategy. For a ratio call diagonal, the long call is always going to be in the money every single time. So that's kind of why it's strategy dependent. It's what gives some of the risk profiles to the specific strategy, what it does. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So the last one, long or short? Good question. That one, I don't want to answer, but I have to, because there is a discrete way to answer that. And I would have to, oh God, it's so difficult. I would, have, I would have to go with, I would have to go with short options. I would probably short options more than buy them. But again, in reality, I probably sell options 65% of the time and then sell options 30, or buy options 35%, something like that. So I do them both like pretty regularly. But I hope not next. What's that? A naked short's not. Protected shorts, yes. Of course. All the time. All, All the time. time. Okay. Nice. They're not 
they're, they're, they're not as scary as people think. That's that's actually one of the, the things we would be really fun to talk about in a future session because like if I'm trading earnings, for example, I'm gonna trade short strangles. That's short and out of the money, call and put, both naked. There's nothing to control the risk there. So how do you control the risk and create something that makes sense? Two ways. One, you size the trade logically, understanding how things can move. Two, you have a large number of occurrences of that strategy so that you might have one that hurts you pretty bad relatively. But if you have enough occurrences, it smooths those returns. The problem is people, they want their cake and they want to eat it too. So we want to have some of the return profiles of options, but we don't want to take risk. Tough way to make money in markets that way. So there's different strategies that might be exonerated for that kind of person. But yeah, definitely all the time, naked options, no doubt. Perfect, thank you. I think I asked enough questions. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Eric, for coming on uh, Chat with Traders Community. This is uh, sure. um, definitely learned some new things here and uh, hope this has been a value for all our listeners and future uh, future watchers of this uh, recorded show. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I had a blast. And then the, the last thing I would mention for you guys specifically is if there are specific topics or things that you guys are interested in for any other conversations, just let me know. That's kind of what I do with these is I, I tailor these to the audience to Try to provide information that is as pertinent as I possibly can. Fantastic. Yeah, we'll have this recorded and encourage people to watch it and ask them, you know, what they want to be interested in, in discussing next in the next session. Yeah, for but sure. For yeah. me personally, Eric, I would love to learn more about, you know, kind of your risk management strategies surrounding options and, and riskier um, strategies of options. Got it. Yeah, that's a it's a great conversation. So the two the two follow on conversations I had baked in my head were going to be talking about strategies, like how to build a strategy, and I think that's a great conversation that we can talk some about that risk management. And then the second conversation I was going to have with you guys was actually like managing a portfolio that has options in it. So, yeah, I think we can definitely hit those. How long do you hold your positions for options most of the time in average? Great question. Um, I would probably say I would have to weight them by I would have to weight them by size because I trade zero DTE options and earnings, right. which would really skew that number because zero DTE, right? Sub day. But as a percentage of like the risk that I'm allocating to the portfolio, it's actually very small. So on like a risk allocated perspective, I would say something between two and four weeks. Something like that, I think, would be about accurate. But if I were to look at it as a raw number, it would be very skewed to the short-term time frame because of the frequency of zero DTE and stuff like that. But like I said, that's typically a small amount of my risk. Okay, okay. nice. All right, thanks. Yeah, definitely. Well, cool. thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, thanks everyone. Eric.